Here's an example where t of n is equal to half of n squared minus 3n. Now we claim that t of n is equal to theta of n squared here. What do I mean by that? Well, if you go back to the definition of theta of n squared, to say that t of n is theta of n squared is to say that for large enough values of n, the curve for t of n is going to be sandwiched between two constant multiples of n squared. So here I have drawn t of n in red. So we are looking at values of n from 0 onwards and even though n is discrete, the input size to a problem is always discrete we are still going to treat these curves as if they are continuous curves just to, uh, just to assist in visualizing what is happening over here. Now if you look at values of n that are greater than this threshold value n0, you are going to find that the curve for t of n is sandwiched between the curve half of one fourth of n squared and the curve for n squared. Right? So if we we basically want to come up with two curves, two green curves, C1 times n squared and C2 times n squared, such that we can claim that T of n is sandwiched between these two curves for large enough values of n. And one way to come up with these two curves is to look at the dominant term, which is half of n squared here, choose a value of c1 that is less than the coefficient here, and choose a value of c2 that is bigger than the coefficient here. Right, so I have chosen here c1 to be 1 by 4 and c2 to be 1. So one of the coefficients is smaller than half, the other coefficient is bigger than half. So C1 is, C1 is sorry, is 1 by 4, C2 is equal to 1. Now for this choice of C1 and C2, we can see that beyond a certain point, T of n is going to be sandwiched between these two curves. And what is that point? Well, if we just focus on c1 n square and t of n. So we want t of n to be greater than or equal to c1 times n square. c1 here is 1 4 and t of n is half of n square minus 3n. What happens when n is when n grows large? Well as n grows large half of n square is going to dominate the value of this expression. The magnitude of this lower order term is going to become relatively insignificant compared to half of n squared. And on the left hand side you have a function that is one fourth of n squared. So if we take this left hand side over here, we get one fourth of n squared. And if we take this term on the left left hand side we get one fourth of n square is greater than or equal to three three n. Now n goes as n goes large we know that this will always hold for large values of n because this function is growing very fast. This function is growing linearly whereas this function is going growing in a quadratic way. So eventually this function is going to overtake this linear function. Uh, which basically means that t of n is going to be greater than or equal to c1 times n squared once n grows large enough. So that point beyond which t of n is always greater than one fourth of n squared can be calculated from this inequality. When will one fourth of n squared be greater than or equal to 3 times n? It will be greater when 
n by 4 is greater than or equal to 3 or n is greater than or equal to 12. So once the value of n is grows beyond 12, p of n is going to it's going to go it's going to rise above the curve for one fourth of n square. And if we compare p of n with the other curve, which is simply n square, when will this inequality hold? In other words, when will half of n square minus 3n be less than or equal to n square? Well, this is always going to hold. As soon as you take a value of n that's greater than or equal to 0, this will always be true because the curve for n square rises like this. Whereas the curve for p of n first falls and then rises. And at each point, n square is going to be greater than or equal to half of n square minus 3n because we can we can take this term on the right hand side. And so we'll get, once we take this term on the right hand side, we're going to get half of n square. And when is half of n square greater than or equal to minus 3n? Well, it's always greater than minus greater than or equal to minus three n. So, this condition uh, applies for all n greater than or equal to zero. This condition applies for all n greater than or equal to twelve. So, if we take a value of n that is greater than or equal to twelve, we are guaranteed that both these inequalities are going to hold. Okay, C two is one here, so I can write this as n square. I can write this as C two times n square. It doesn't matter. So, going back to the definition of the theta notation, there exist constants c1 and c2 here such that beyond a certain point, that is beyond a value of 12, the curve for p of n is going to be sandwiched between the curves for c1 of c1 n square and c2 n square. And this is why we say that p of n is theta of n square. 